Did you guys know that the average time from ordering your burger at the drive-thru to collecting it at the window is about 180 seconds, give and take. I suppose, uh, I'm not sure if that's Australian timings or uh, American timings, but what I did read was that there's a, a, a McDonald's uh, in Florida that is aiming to get it down to one minute. Uh, now, we certainly live in a fast-paced world uh, where, where uh, everything needs to happen quickly. Uh, fast foods need to be delivered fast. Uh, when uh, we go onto the internet, where we were once quite content with dial-up, now it frustrates us if I don't immediately, if the page don't immediately open up when I press, press that tab. And, and really, we, as I said, we live in this, this super fast uh, society, uh, uh, really one that, that caters to and develops our uh, yeah, intolerance for, for, for waiting. Uh, we are not very patient. Uh, with certain things, and and uh, what may be a, a good uh, idea for 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 access to the internet and and even f fast food uh, is doesn't work when it comes to matters of faith. When it comes to matters of believing, of growing our faith, patience is what God uses. Endurance is what God used. Perseverance is what God used. For, for in order for us to grow in our faith, means that we have to wait for God to answer our prayers. We have to wait for the fulfillment of His promises. And, and so perseverance and endurance is something that cultivates and grows our faith. Um, now, when it comes to those times of testing, the times of, of, of trials, the tri times of tribulation that we may experience, and there may be many of you among us that, that are suffering uh, in that way, it is at those times when we easily get discouraged, um, despondent, uh, even maybe despairing, doubting, losing hope, uh, not knowing, not understanding why this is happening, maybe not seeing the outcome, the end, and therefore are all the more troubled by it. And this is really where Judah found themselves having been dispossessed from their land, having been displaced to a, to a different country, a foreign country. Uh, and for the most part, many of them did not know the length of time that they would be there. Although Jeremiah did prophesy 70 years, it was only after they have been there for almost that length of time that Daniel discovered that through reading Jeremiah and started to intercede the Lord for their, their return. But in that time, they were desperate. They were despairing. They lived in a, in a pagan world. Uh, and this is, as I said, where we find ourselves in, in Isaiah 40. And Isaiah writing to this future generation, uh, knowing the human heart and knowing what uh, people struggle with. And he, and he gives them really the answer. An answer that was relevant to them and an answer that is relevant and applicable to us today is that when we go through trials, when we suffer, uh, that we need to cling to the Lord. We need to remember Him, who He is. We need to shun all other uh, possible outcomes, all, all, possible, all other possible helps. And we need to wait on Him who will strengthen us. 
And so let me pray for us, and then we'll look at Isaiah chapter 40, and our morning's passage is from verse 27 through to 31. Um, Father, we, we come to you, Lord, uh, in need of your grace, in need of your mercy, Lord, uh, astounded by your kindness to us, uh, humbled, Lord, by your love for us, uh, and Lord, hungry for your word to us this morning. And so, Lord, we pray that you would speak to us, that you would speak to us through this passage, Lord, for each and one of us, at some stage, Lord, if we haven't had done so already, will go through a time of difficulty. Uh, Lord, there is no true faith unless it is a tested faith. And so, Lord, we know that you will test our faith and grow us through that. And so we pray, Lord, that we would learn the lesson that you have for us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. And so here we have um, Judah in, in Babylon. Uh, we've already seen that God comforted them with this message, a message that, that the end is near, that, that uh, the salvation is, is coming, that they need to prepare themselves for the coming of the Lord, uh, that His word is true, that it will not waver, that it alone will stand, and that they need to proclaim that message. Then we saw how incomparable God is to all other gods, that He is not impotent, He is not weak, uh, He is not uh, absent, uh, that they uh, should lose hope. And so in verse 27, Isaiah confronts them, and he asks them these things in verse 27, Why do you say, O Jacob, and assert, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and the justice due me escapes the notice of my God. And so after years in Babylon, Judah was starting to, to lose hope. They were despairing. They were doubting God and His promises, thinking He must be blind to their plight. He must be really indifferent to their sufferings. Maybe, maybe he wasn't God in Babylon. We know he was God in Israel, but maybe he wasn't God in Babylon because he's certainly not here. Look at us. Look how we suffer. Look how we struggle. We live in this pagan world. And so they start questioning his character. They start doubting his faithfulness. They maybe wonder, has God has he forgotten to be gracious to us? Has he, has, he, has he overlooked us? Is our way hidden from him? Does he see the justice due to me escapes his notice? Does, does he not care? Does he, does he not, can he not help? Why doesn't he help? Does he lack power? Does he lack strength? Has his love for us grow cold? And Judah was rattled. The people of, of Judah was rattled. Their faith had taken a beating. It was shaken by the circumstances. And it would appear as they have lost hope that they were in despair. And when, you, when, you, when you've lost hope, the only companion left really is despair. And it is a dreadful company to keep. And even Christians, we Christians are not immune to this. We are not immune to despair like Judah, who we find ourselves living in this sin-cursed world, this, this hostile world, this, this world that is uh, foreign to us in many ways, foreign to the values, uh, at least to us, uh, hostile to the things of God. And... Uh, Sometimes when we experience unending opposition, imposition, uh, persecution, it may rattle us. Uh, when it's, when, 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 whether that is governments or, or groups or individuals that, that targets us, that, that opposes us, 
that marginalize us, that ridicule us, all because of our love for Christ and our desire to be faithful to Him and His Word. And, and it seems like things are not getting any better. It rattles us. It, it concerns us. Or when we are experiencing unrelieved health problems, whether it's you personally or maybe even worse, uh, someone you love, someone you know, and, and there is no cure, there's no relief in sight, um, and you see them in pain constantly, or you yourself is in constant pain. Maybe a serious life-threatening illness. It disturbs us. It rattles us. And we may lose hope and we may even despair in moments like that. Or maybe when we are experiencing unrelenting difficulties. You just never seem to get a break. It's one thing after another. If it's not, if it's not stress at work, it's strife within the family. Or then it's a shortage of money. Or, and there's no relief. There's no outcome. And it doesn't matter what you do. You just can't seem to escape. And these things rattle us. These things may, may cause us to lose hope and, and despair. Or may, may experience unprofitable service for the Lord. When you have been faithfully teaching your kids from the Bible and they treat it as irrelevant to their lives. When you have been constantly witnessing to your spouse, your loved ones, others about the Lord and, and they s seem deaf and, and blind to the good news of Jesus Christ. When you have poured your heart out, expand yourself in loving service and to the Lord and, and uh, just faithfully pointing others to Christ, faithfully uh, adhering to the Scriptures, faithfully doing the works of faith, doing the labor of love, discipling others, and yet you see little visible fruit. That is discouraging. That may rattle us. That may cause despair. And we may ask these questions, the same questions what Judah asked is, Lord, don't you see? Don't you care? Lord, can't you change people? Lord, can't you change me? Why do I battle with these fears and doubts? And so it's when we are uns unsuccessful in seeking after God, when the Lord seems distant, absent, when your prior prayers bounce back from the ceiling, when His Word becomes hard to read and seems to have lost His power, when your peace flees away and, and there is no joy in, in your fellowship with the Lord or with uh, of His people. That, that rattles us. That, that disturbs us. That may cause us despair. And so Isaiah questioned them, having already given them much about information about God. He says, why do you say, why do you assert? Assert is, is a stronger term. It is, they are adamant about this, that God doesn't see. He, he doesn't see any... He, uh, the justice due to us uh, is not coming. He's indifferent. And he refers, interestingly, he refers to them as to Jacob and then to Israel. And I think that is very significant at the beginning of this passage. Uh, what is, uh, Isaiah has grasped this critical truth that he is trying to communicate to those in Babylon and by combining these two names by which they would go, Judah, uh, sorry, Jacob uh, was one of their forefathers, and of course Israel was the name that, that he was given. And really this is pointing them to their, to their history and to their ancestry and, and pointing out to them that, that Judah, you are from a, a, a people from a, a long line of those who have clung to the Lord, who have wrestled with the Lord. 
And, and we, we go back to, to Genesis 32 when, when we read of Jacob being in a time of his distress, a crisis in his life when he were to meet his brother Esau. Remember, he defrauded his brother from his birthright and from his blessing. And now, after some time, he's to, about to meet him. And so he was fearful. This was a crisis in his life. He was afraid that Esau was going to take his life and the life of his family. And so we read that on the night before he was to meet Esau, he was wrestling with a man. And it was a, it was a fierce struggle, so much so that his hip got dislocated. But Jacob would not let this man go until he blessed him. And we read in Genesis 32, verse 26, and then he, this is the man, whether that was an angel or the, or, or the Lord, we, we don't know, uh, let me go for the dawn is breaking. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And so he said to them, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. And Jacob strove with God and prevailed. And, and, and his name was changed to Israel and God blessed him. And so the encouragement to Judah was that, listen, in your time now, your time of crisis, your time of trouble, cling to the Lord. Don't give up. Don't let go. Hold on to Him. Wrestle with Him. Because then blessing will come. And His blessing only comes through perseverance, through endurance, through clinging to Him. And what was true of Jacob was true of Judah and is true of us today as Christian believers who live by faith. Blessing comes through perseverance. Salvation belongs to those who persevere to the end. That's what James also reminds us. James chapter 1 verse 12 says, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. And really, the Lord has given us everything we need to persevere to the end. He has granted us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, Ephesians 1.3. He has called us by His own glory and excellence, 2, Timothy, uh, sorry, 2 Peter 1.3. And He has granted to us His, His precious and magnificent promises, verse 4 of that same chapter. And all the promises we find, find their yes in Christ Jesus, 1 Corinthians 1.12 tells us. But what does he ask of us? Cling to them. Hold on to them. Cling to Christ and his word. Persevere and do not let go. Do not lose hope. Paul exhorts Timothy in a similar way when he faced opposition. He says, pay close attention to yourself and your teaching. Persevere in these things. For as you do this, you will ensure salvation both of yourself and those who hear you. And so the first point that Isaiah was making here in, this, in questioning them was, when you are rattled by doubt, when you are despairing, Cling to the Lord. Hold on to Him. And so how do we do that? He goes on and says, Do you not know? Have you not heard? Verse 28. The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. And Isaiah say this almost in a, in a, in a way chastising them for forgetting. For the problem Judah had was not that they did not know. It was not that they've never heard, but they forgot what they've heard. They, theirs was a doubt and a despair not uh, caused by an excusable sort of ignorance. There was a culpable forgetfulness. 
of God. Theirs was an impeachable disregard for his holy character and his reliable word. They have forgotten who God is. And really, everything that means anything in this world matters and depends on who God is. And so Isaiah urged them to remember, to remember, remember that God is the everlasting God. He is not bound by time, nor changed by time. With the, with the everlasting Lord, one day is like a thousand years, Scripture says. With the everlasting Lord, His word is ever true, and His loving kindness is unchanging. We, on the other hand, we are bound by time, and the now, the present, is all we have. It's all that we can experience. If you think, th think about that, yesterday is gone. We can't have that over, and tomorrow we don't have yet. All we have is the now, is the present. And so when we suffer, when we face difficulties, when we, we are in distress and we uh, face dangers, that urgency of the moment, that, that tyranny of the, of the now, the pressures of that day sort of squeeze us to seek relief immediately now. I want an outcome now. And, and, it, and it may even cause us, corral us to make a, a decision and a choice that may be sinful, that may be going against our knowledge of the Lord. Why? Because we seek relief now. And we forget that the Lord is the everlasting Lord. He already knows tomorrow. He owns tomorrow. Whatever is going to happen tomorrow, He already planned and purposed it, and it will happen exactly as He planned and purposed. And so we, because of the pressures of us on, in the day, we say, Lord, I will trust you today if I can see tomorrow, <laughs> if I can see the outcome, as I, if I can see the, uh, the hope. I uh, described it before, as we, we love to say, well, I, I will trust the Lord, I will walk with you, but just take me up in a helicopter, high above, and I can see, okay, this is the path, and the end is there. Then I will trust you, Lord. The Lord says, no, trust me in the now. Even when you can't see tomorrow, trust me now. And so, people, uh, theology, doctrine, what you believe about God matters. And a neglect of theology or a dereliction of doctrine will enable sin, will embolden sin, self and Satan to steal your joy and savage your peace. And it will drag you off to the dungeon of doubt and despair. Remember, Isaiah said, the Lord is an everlasting Lord. He is God over yesterday, He's God today, and He's God over tomorrow. You can trust Him. And furthermore, remember that He is the Creator. He's the Creator of the ends of the earth. We read, John 1, 3 tells us that all things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. He made it all, and His plans and His purposes involve it all. There is not a place in this universe where He is not present and not involved to bring about His plans and purposes. He is ever-present and ever active. And so King David discovered that when he wrote Psalm 139, where he says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, meaning going eastwards, if I dwell in the remotest past of the sea, going westwards, even there your hand will lead me, 
and your right hand will lay hold of me. Psalm 139. And he made the ends of the earth. And he was saying to that Judah, he's not only concerned about you. This is not just about what God is accomplishing for you. He has the whole universe in mind. He's, he's dealing with the whole of creation. And it doesn't mean that he does not care about you. Because he cares for every little creature and every aspect of his creation. And so the plans and purposes not only involve your life, but everybody's life. Not just you and your family and your nation, but every family in every nation. God is at work. And so much of the world and what happens in it uh, really is important to us only as it relates to us, when it affects us. Uh, when it doesn't re directly impact us, we don't really care. Uh, and so Judah was troubled because here they are in Babylon and they thought that God has forgotten them. Perhaps God was absent from Babylon, that he was not there. But God is ever present and he actively cares for every part of his creation. And so the same is true for us. Wherever you may go, whether you may be alone or think you are alone or that God is absent when you are on a business trip or uh, in your FIFO accommodation or even alone at home, he is there, and he cares what you do or fail to do. You may be tempted that God is absent when anxiety paralyzes you, perhaps for fear of the bullies, bullies at school, or fear of reprisals at work, maybe for defending someone, or fear of even domestic abuse, domestic violence, both verbal and physical. He is there. He sees. He cares. Sometimes we are tempted to think God is absent in the pain of illness. <laughs> when he keeps you up all night, and you think, I'm all alone. Uh -huh. Or when you lie alone in a hospital bed. Or when you kneel alone at a recently closed grave and you ask, where is God? He is there. He is ever present, ever working, bringing about his plans and purposes even through these things that we do not understand. And so where is God? He is there and he cares for us. And as we cling to him and we behold him, remember that, that he is the creator of the, the ends of the earth, that he made the universe and is, and is really orchestrating world history, national history, family history, individual histories to the music of his sovereign composition. In time, in key, without ever missing a note, directing us through the crescendos and the diminuendos of his masterpiece. We need to trust him, is the call. So remember that he is the everlasting God, that he owns tomorrow, that he is the creator God of all things, that he is ever present, and that he never tires, he never wearies. When we're... Creation talks about his omnipresence. Here it talks about him never tiring, talks about him being all-powerful. All-powerful not uh, with a focus on the potency of his power, but on the permanency. It never runs out. It never, de de never depleted. It never diminishes. It is infinite in supply. He never grows weary. He never tires. 
And he's always working, always active. He does not need rest or recuperation. He is ever alert, ever fresh, ever invigorated, ever able to work, ever strong to act, ever able to accomplish all his plans and purposes in our lives. And we, on the other hand, again, we get tired. We need rest. Every time you fall asleep at night, that's a reminder to you that you are a dependent being. You are a limited being. You need to be recharged and refreshed. And not so with God. He never tires. He never becomes weary. And because of that, he is never asleep at the post. He's never asleep at the wheel. As, as the psalmist says, that the Lord is our keeper and he never sleeps nor slumbers. He's, he's not exhausted by his efforts. But he's able to work and bring about a myriad of things that you and I are not even aware of in everyday life. Um, and so he is the one of inexhaustible strength. Remember that, that he is not powerless. And it's not that his strength has, ru strength has run out when you are in trouble. And so you can pray to him. You can bring your big requests. You can bring your small requests. You can bring your impossible requests. Because he does not become tired. He is also all wise. His wisdom is inscrutable. His understanding is inscrutable, unmeasurable, unfathomable, and therefore really beyond question. He is all-knowing and all-wise. And we will never be able to fully comprehend him or his ways. And the, listen, the, the, the trinkets of wisdom that we may gain from his understanding comes from this treasure trove, the size of which is beyond our understanding and our imagination. And this is important for us when we encounter trials and tribulations and troubles, when difficult things happen and difficult things continue. And difficult things end badly. But you will remember, he is wise. You may, don't, you may not understand. You may not see the reason. You may be puzzled and perplexed. But he is not. He knows. And he knows the best way to bring about his plans and purposes. Cling to him. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so His ways are higher and His thoughts are higher than our thoughts and ways. I read uh, to some of the survivors of the Jewish Holocaust. Uh, interesting to, to, to read in... in looking at, at perseverance under, under suffering and how different people responded. In one family, uh, the father had unshakable faith in God who said that if God, if, if, if God limits himself only to what men can understand, it is impossible for him to be God. While the mom had both faith and blaming God for what happened. And we're talking about horrendous atrocities. And then other members of the family have fallen away and said, they don't want anything to do with a God who allows that to happen. And people, it's, it's easy for us when we have never truly walked in the depth of some valleys that others have walked. Uh, and we may never understand. Job never got an answer. He was just reminded of God's greatness. And so here, Isaiah is calling Judah, and as he is calling us today, he's, God is wise. He knows what he is doing, even though we don't, and we don't understand. 
and we question, the answer is cling to Him. Cling to Him. Know Him. Understand who He is and hold on to who He is. He is the God of infinite strength. And He is the one who will be able to renew our ourselves with with strength verse 29 he gives strength to the weary and to him who lacks might he increases power though youths grow weary and tired and vigorous men stumble badly i think first of all we, i just want to talk about the need for 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 strength you see as judah was living in in babylon exiled into babylon they really needed the strength uh, they needed to be empowered by the Lord for them to live as God's people in this pagan society, in this idolatrous society. And there were uh, pressures on them as, as, a, as a people, as a, as a community of those who, who, who were professing God, faith in God in Babylon. They had pressures from the outside, which is from the society they lived in, the idolatrous, immoral culture that they were immersed in, in, in a people that do not know and do not understand and maybe not even want to know about the God of Israel. And then there were pressures from within the community of faith. There were those that were half-hearted, those whose devotion to the Lord was seriously compromised and who believed that possibly a large amount of self-focus and self-serving pride was, was to be reconciled with, with a loyalty to, to God, to the Lord. And these people would be often absent and out of step with others who were wholeheartedly clinging and holding on, devoted to the Lord. Then there were the, the faint-hearted, those who lacked the courage of their convictions, who failed to stand for the Lord, failed to oppose evil, failed to, to pursue righteousness, those who would not speak up for the Lord, those who would, would really would bend with every wind and be carried along with every stream wherever it may take them. Then there were the, the cold-hearted, and the hard-hearted. The hard-hearted would be those who just do not believe, did not believe in God. They've lost their faith. And the cold-hearted were those who love the things of the world. The sinful pleasures of the world still had an irresistible attraction to them. And they were culpably careless in avoiding places of temptation and whose hearts were not grieved by the shame and reproach that their sin would, would bring to, to the Lord and, and to his people. And so you have pressures from outside, pressures from within a community that they have to dealt with. And then over the passing of time and their forgetfulness of who God is, their lack of remembering him, that is what caused discouragement. And it's something that we need to think of, that our actions, how we are we cold-hearted, hard-hearted, half-hearted, faint-hearted, and how that affects others in the community of our faith, how the world impacts on, on, on the church, that we don't contribute to that. And that is why Judah was discouraged. They were dissatisfied, they were despairing, and they were in desperate need to be strengthened by the Lord. But it is not human strength. The strength that comes from the Lord should not be confused with human ability and human capacity. It says there, verse 30, even youth grow weary and tire, and vigorous young men stumble badly. So the strength is 
to endure, the strength to persevere, the strength to cling to the Lord is not through human strength, through human ability, capacity. These things normally peak in our youth. I mean, when we're young and we are vigorous and we are at the peak of our powers and, and uh, even that is insufficient to sustain the man and woman of faith. And so Isaiah was saying to endure, to persevere, is to cling to the Lord, to remember the Lord in the midst of difficult times. And we need his supernatural spiritual power that we can draw from his limitless supply. Human strength, not enough. Spiritual endurance <laughs> is not sustained by physical strength. Perseverance in the faith is not fueled by human capacity or ability. For that is limited and it will run out. It will be exhausted. And so when you are finding yourself in despair that your personal spiritual revival is not dependent on whether you can pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. It's not dependent on your strength or even someone else's who come alongside you and to hold you up through their ability, their natural ability. And so whether it's personal spiritual revival or, or corporate or national revival that Judah needed, uh, it does not depend on human ability. And I can just imagine that, that they may have turned uh, in this, in this society, the, the, uh, the community of Judah in, in Babylon, when they were seeing that uh, many were, were falling away, uh, many lost their faith in this continuous pressure of, of being in a foreign land, the, the, the pressures from without, the pressures from within. Uh, and so they may well have turned to the young and the energetic uh, to the vibrant and the enthusiastic. Um, maybe their strength, maybe, maybe their energy will revitalize the people of God. But Isaiah warned that that would fail. And in some way we see that in the church today. When there are congregations that are dwindling and dying. And the people are discouraged and despondent. Longing back to the days when the church was, was full and vibrant and active. And they failed to have protected themselves from the pressures on the outside and the pressures from within. And they failed to remember the Lord their God. They failed to cling to Him. And now they are starting to look to answers elsewhere. And the youth was who they turned to. Instead of humbly seeking the Lord in repentant faith and going back to what is important, back to the basics of pursuing the Lord through word and prayer and worship and service. And so they may say that if only we had a few young people in our church, if only uh, we can attract more young people, for they have the energy and the strength and the vigor of youth. And so they look to man instead of to the Lord. And they start giving preference to those who have ability instead of who have true spirituality, true faith. And so they may seek to appoint those with natural leadership, sharp intellect, articulate, charismatic in personality, extroverted, who understands the culture, who is a consummate people gatherer, an avid networker, a mover and shaker among his peers. And they forget and or neglect to look at the man's spirituality, their love for Christ, their fidelity to the word, their dedication to prayer, their death to self and their devotion to Christ, to see if their faith has actually been tested in the cauldron of life. And so we need strength.
strength, but we don't need human strength. We need strength from the Lord, and that comes only through waiting on the Lord. Verse 31, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. And so Isaiah, in, in, in in this whole section really was, was really seeding his encouragement right in the beginning by referring to Jacob and Israel, telling them they need to cling. Cling to what? Cling to the Lord who he is. Remember who he is. And warn them not to seek help from other sources other than God. Turn to God and cling to him. And then when you will see the fruit of waiting on him, and, and, and waiting on Him is not a time of inactivity. Waiting on the Lord is not a time of idleness. It is a time of persistent prayer, a time of, of constantly reminding ourselves of who God is through His Word and holding on to His promises. The power of God will come to those who wait on Him, who cling to Him when it seems like all is lost, who walk with Him when, when things are difficult today and tomorrow looks even darker, to, to not let go of Him when you don't see and you don't understand why things are happening, to keep calling on Him even when the heavens are brass and you are, there's no answer to your prayer, to stand on His Word, to cling on His promises, to be steadfast, immovable, abounding in the Word, work of the Lord, knowing that your work in the Lord is not in vain. And you will renew strength and find strength when you walk with Him like Enoch did, believed in Him like Abraham did, delight in Him like David, always pointing to Him like John the Baptist, assured of His love like John, uh, the Apostle John was, faithfully and fearlessly serving like Paul did, and who pray to him like the Apostle James, who had the nickname Camel Knees because he was on his knees praying so much. It's when we wait on the Lord by faith that he will strengthen us, that he will give us the power to endure the difficulties, the dark days. And lastly, he says, we will gain with uh, those who wait on the Lord, will gain new strength, will mount up with wings of eagles, will run and not get tired, will walk and not become weary. Now, it's difficult to understand exactly what Isaiah meant by that. Um, there's a few different ways to, to think about it. Maybe it relates to age. When you are young, you are soaring in terms of the, the heights that you can reach. Maybe middle age. You are running, and old age, you are, you are walking. Or it may relate to, to the activities of our faith. Uh, and I probably lean towards that, is that we, we are renewed in power, then you will sprout wings and soar like an eagle, like eagles who can reach I mean, incredible heights and effortlessly soars on the thermal currents the invisible thermal currents, reaching incredible heights. And so those who are, who are carried by the strength of the Lord, the thermal currents of the Lord, they will soar to heights of, of, of incredible fellowship, dizzying heights of fellowship and service. And while the soaring relates to how high one can go, the, the running, I think, relates to speed and how quickly you may grasp things, how quickly things may happen, how effective you may be when you draw strength from the limitless tank of God's power. And to walk has the idea of the common everyday drudgery of life. As you trust Him, you are, you, are, you are encouraged, you are strengthened by Him in the mundane, doing the same things every day. And I think it's uh, William Carey who, who was the missionary to India and translated uh, the Bible in 39 of the different Indian languages. He said he had but one gift, and that is to plod. He's a great plodder. He just keeps doing and keep 
on working. And so the same for us too, to have the strength to endure and endure and endure. But however you interpret these things, the strength of the Lord will, be able to, will enable you to resist temptation from the evil one. Temptation that seeks to disable and destroy your faith. It will help you to endure the most severest and the longest of trials. It will help you to continue in a life pleasing to the Lord, growing in Christ-like character and godliness. It will enable you to bear the fruit of the Spirit in every season and under all conditions. It will enable you to witness with boldness to all people about the grace of God found in Christ. And it will enable you to persevere in every good work, the work of faith, the labor of love, the steadfastness of hope. And so this morning, through the word of Isaiah, the Lord encouraged us to cling to him to not let go of him in times of trouble, in times of despair, to remember him, to know him, to draw close to him, and not to be entangled with human efforts, human strength, but to draw strength from him by waiting, by persevering, by enduring. And as we do, he grows us, he strengthens us to enable us. I pray that the Lord will help us in doing that. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for your amazing grace, Lord. Thank you for your blueprint, Lord, to us in, in many ways of how to persevere, how to endure when we are rattled by circumstances, when the events of our life knocks us off balance and cause us to take our eyes off you. Lord, help us that we would cling to you and not let go, that we would look to you and know you for who you are, that we would not rely on our own strength or anyone else's, but that we will draw our strength from you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.